thought for sure I was going to be here by myself this morning and nobody would remember the time change. Glad you're here. Excited to see what the Lord has to say to us today. I don't know if it's just the, the spring and the things coming, but I just feel it rising in my soul that even though we struggle and have all these issues in life, I'm just talking about Bill because he's coming in, but knowing that there's challenges and things, but the sun never gets tired of coming up in the morning in God's faithfulness. What a reminder. So you're going to see a lot of the <clears throat> announcements rolling through, too many to even mention. There is a quick one, though, I'll say, because it's Wednesday, and if you haven't come to a Wednesday, it's a little bit different than this because we have interaction, but especially this Wednesday, we're going to have a small bonfire, little hot dog thing, nothing to fill up on, but just a fellowship. We're going to have our worship Wednesday, acoustic style, that'll be outside, and then a time of fellowship, but more importantly, the, and I say important, the testimonies. We, we did this last fall, and it was so encouraging to me to hear people sharing about things the Lord had done in their life, stuff that might have even embarrassed them to say, but they did, and it really encouraged everybody that was there, so want to do that again. That'll be Wednesday night, and you're going to see some other things coming through. Calendar's up to date, as far as I know, and just a lot of things happening. want to start with prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, righteous God, Abba, Lord, you are our defender, our strong tower, you are our healer, our physician. God, you're Jehovah Jireh, our provider, all the names of the great I am, and we worship you today. I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters, Father, for visitors, for people who are in your kingdom, part of your body, the global church, and Lord, for the privilege that we have to assemble, to gather, to be able to humble ourselves before you, God, and to know that life is worth the living, even to hear a, a baby cry and to know that there's sounds of kids in the room and how that blesses my soul. Lord, for the folks that take care of the children's church with just a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and creativity and energy and the work that's done there, God, from indoors to outdoors, you are so good to us. We bless you, Lord, as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning that you bring an outpouring of your Holy Spirit in a mighty and profound way as we bless you asking it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Corner Post Cowboy Church. It is good to see everybody here, and we have some visitors here today that have never been here, and we might have somebody on Facebook that this is the first time they've ever turned into Corner Post Cowboy Church, and we're glad they're with us too. Make yourself at home. We, we, love, we love everybody as far as I know, <laughs> and, I, and it's good to be here. I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, Mike said there's announcements scrolling but I do want to say that in three weeks just three more Sundays it is Easter Easter is early this year and our church has special plans it is on a fifth Sunday and fifth Sundays are usually our singing Sundays and a potluck lunch so we're going to kind of trade that around for Easter and we're going to have a sunrise service and sunrise is at 703 so you need to be here by 6.45 so you can see that sun come up and, and Mike can get started and we can have some worship. And then after the sunrise service, we're going to actually have breakfast. So we're going to have a, a potluck breakfast. The church is going to provide some meat. And ladies, you bring all those cinnamon rolls and casseroles and all that good stuff that you make. And we'll have breakfast and we'll have fellowship until it's time for our service. And then we will have some more special singing. I promise you we'll have some more special singing because we all love to sing. We have a great music team and they love to share. And then Mike is going to bring us a sermon. And then Angel and Tracy have planned for us to have an Easter egg hunt after, after church. So hopefully it won't rain and hopefully it'll be a beautiful day and we can all enjoy 
the sunrise service and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he was risen and that he promises us eternal life too if we'll just accept him. And I love him this morning, and I am glad I am in the glory land way. Let's stand up this morning and sing this song. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the way, the bright and shiny way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saved today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. grandson yesterday and I was singing this next song to him and the words of the song are open the eyes of my heart Lord I want to see you I want to see you and I said to him I said do you think you have eyes in your heart and without a hesitation he said well yeah I said well what do you see with the eyes in your heart he's five and he said I see people that love me and I know that I'm cared for open the eyes of your heart to the Lord he loves you, and it will be a great thing that he can do in your heart if you don't know him as your Savior today. And if you're hesitant, if you're hesitant, just open up and let the Lord bless you because he loves you. Praise the Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour down your power and love Holy, 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 holy is the Lamb. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. for a minute. <clears throat> Alright guys, it's that uh, time of morning we get to go uh, meet and greet people that you don't know and meet and greet people that you do know. So uh, We love to shake hands and introduce ourselves and get to know everybody. Oh, would you be free from your burden of sin and power in mention is rodeo bible camp so rodeo bible camp is going well god is providing uh, we've got all of our uh, volunteers already signed up for rodeo bible camp 
We've got around 14 children already signed up, 12. 12 children already signed up. We're believing for God to send the rest of them. Uh, if y'all know anybody, any children from 10 to 18 that would be interested in our Rodeo Bible Camp, let's get them signed up, tell them about it, because right now it's the word of mouth that is spreading like wildfire. I was on the phone with Sandy just yesterday when somebody saw one of our church flyers in one of the uh, feed stores and was talking and asking. Our community doesn't know anything about Rodeo Bible Camp and what it's all about, and so it's, it's great. So y'all just keep pumping it up. And uh, the last thing is, is we're going to have a chili supper on the 23rd singing and a pie auction for all the proceeds to go to pies. not just pies, but cakes, whatever, anything sweet. I'll eat anything. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, that is all the proceeds for that will go to uh, support our rodeo Bible camp. So anything and all that you guys can do, we appreciate you so much. So is that it? <clears throat> oh, there's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life's sea.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. What he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. Cause I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect submission, all is know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps so this is my story and this is my song praising my risen king and savior all the day long I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered that's why I trust him that's why I trust him I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. Our 
Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three and one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name. Lord Jesus, as we come to you this morning, God, Lord, we just thank you so much for the worship service that we just had. God, Lord, we pray that there's touching hearts of each and every person that's here this morning, God, Lord. We pray for the pastor, Lord, in the sermon and the word that you've given him, God, Lord. We pray that it quickens our heart, God, that it means something to us, Lord, and it just makes us better each and every day. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen.
nice thing about vest nice thing about vest weather is you you never know what you're going to find in your pockets no but i tell you what i got some of the one of the sweetest notes today i love you so much sweet i love the kids so getting started uh, you know it's my challenge I got a lot of different directions I'm thinking about going but Luke 640 I know that I have that one established and the idea of cross training probably seven eight different directions you could you could take this and I'll try to make it applicable to a handful of different scenarios so maybe it'll resonate with each person at some point to start with the horses, cross training for a horse means if I have a barrel horse, I use it for other activities. If I have a roping horse, other activities, trail horse. And the idea is to keep it well rounded, but what will happen sometimes to an event horse is they get soured, they get bored, they get tired of doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. and I think people can be that way too. Horses, a lot, a lot of times, you know, if you think about maybe a, a horse that's used for bulldogging or for roping, how hard it is to keep them in the box. You can watch the rough stock and what they do. And in cross training, the idea is to take it where I might have an arena event, but I still use the horse in other arena events. So kind of well-rounded that way, or maybe it's to take it out on a trail ride or to do some things, you know, and I've watched it for me. I didn't really do the event type stuff. We'd, we'd do play days with the kids were younger, but if I had a, a good trail horse, I might use it in a parade, and that way it would get used to different things, or if I'm riding one terrain, you know, maybe it's a dirt road, or getting in some hills and some valleys, the wet, the dry, getting them to do everything was always, it seemed like the horses are happier. Of course, you get them where you have to challenge them to do things they're not used to doing, water crossings and stepping off into steep terrain and things like that, crossing over a log, but it's just like us. And I don't know if you get bored with the same thing over and over and over and over. Now, you, certainly you like things, and you have some consistencies in your life, but to have new challenges. And I'm looking at this horse-related example, and I'm realizing I am the same way. I don't want to just be riding in a circle the rest of my life. I don't want to just be stuck in, in one event or another. I want to have a little variety and see some things. But the benefits of cross-training of a horse gets them more balance because they learn to use their body in different ways besides of just two lefts and a right or going out of the, the suit and doing the job and 20 seconds later going back to the suit. How do we start getting that, that idea for me is applicable? But whether it be the balance, the strength training, the coordination, it eliminates boredom, it gets, keeps them thinking, but it makes for a happier horse. So that's, that's the horse example. I think the same thing at work applies. If you always go in and do the same, the same, the same, the same, it's just, it's hard to look forward to that. You know, being able to, maybe it's the same thing, but you're meeting new people, or maybe it's different things, but the same people. One of the benefits that, that I had growing up in the workplace was my first 20 year career in industrial maintenance, I didn't know what I would do when I clocked in. I didn't know if I'd be working in the engine room, or if I'd be on the roof, or I'd be outside, I might be on a piece of equipment, I might be doing a demo, could be doing an install, did a lot of electrical, plumbing, wiring, all the different facets of the skilled trades. And I like that because I got to learn new things, new techniques, new tools, new issues. But one of the, the things I liked the most was the troubleshooting, diagnostics, and repair. And you actually, if you have been in the trades for a while, I know this applies to other occupations, but maybe you'll find some touch points. I think it was about 10 years in, 
that once I discovered troubleshooting and, and starting off with the simple things first and, and just the whole process of thinking through issues and challenges, I got to a place where even if I had never worked on something specifically, I had the confidence that I could fix it because of the process that you go through. But it's about cross-training. And you get really good at one thing and the next level, the next level, the next level, and how that fits. So I want to take those two examples, whether it's the horse side, maybe it's the occupation. It could be even in fitness with the cross-training and fitness. You know, the people that, that are using the, the exercise and the, the physical resistance gain strength, they gain stamina, they gain a lot more health and the things that kind of cross athletes, people that can go from track to turf to the swimming pool and compete in all those different areas. So those are three examples I wanted to use as we look at a passage in the book of Luke. And it says in Luke 640, the student is not above their teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Other translations would say a disciple is not like their teacher, but once they're fully trained, they'll be like their teacher. You think about Jesus in the cross-training aspect. Jesus was great with every group of person. He could minister to the blind, the lame, the deaf, the mute. He dealt with demon possession. He had kids that would come to him. He worked with widows. The idea that Jesus is cross-trained, creator God, he knows how we're made, he made us, he designed things in a way to develop a greater truth for spiritual, eternal applications, but Jesus going from carpenter to being on a boat, land and water, the idea that we have the potential to be like him. Even the, the concept of being fully trained. I don't know if you ever thought about how long it takes to get fully trained. I deal a lot with it in my, workforce, in my workplace now around workforce. But if you want to be in the, the medical field, you can be fully trained as a phlebotomy tech, in a dialysis clinic, as a medication assistant, as a certified, you know, if it's uh, anything from... CPN to LPN to RN, to, and you can, you can be fully trained in some of these entry level, whether it's paramedic EMT, in the matter of months. But then you're fully trained, and it takes years to arrive in that, that area of competence. To think about how long does it take to be fully trained as a, a BSN, what well, takes four years on average. But then to actually really arrive at the place where you can handle every situation, it takes many more years. Electrician, plumber, the license trades, apprenticeship, that's a four-year thing. But if you look at it and really try to understand, you get the fully trained aspect of it. And that's what we had the attempt to do in whether it's vocational education or workplace. And, and I have a strong message around this. You already know that I think that every... Thing taught in high school should lead to a meaningful career, whether it's something that's, you know, some people would call it liberal arts. I realized the other day as I was talking to, I was surrounded by a people, a group of people that were all liberal arts, very talented in, in the, the liberal, and I, I'm trying to be nice, an area that I'm not talented in, and I realized, wow, I guess I focused on conservative arts because I want to be able to do things with my hands. I want to be able to have an outcome that I could actually make something, do something, fix something, do something, and not work that really didn't have a product. I've been very product-oriented. And not to take away from people that are gifted in, the, in the, the skills of poetry or in fine literature. Wonderful. I build things. I fix things, and I sweat when I do it. 
I have dirty my fingernails and calluses. I'm proud of that. And I think it's important that we be cross-trained, that we have the ability to do things. But you notice, the better you get at the skills and the trades and the, the hard jobs, the, the things I'm describing, the more of a jerk you are. And you guys, especially the people in the trades, know that if you find a really phenomenal builder, fixer, mechanic, painter, automotive tech, whatever, the, the, the better they get at their job and their craft and their trade, they're more <laughs> difficult to be around. They haven't been cross-trained. You know, you don't find people that are really, really good diesel automotives. And I'm trying to think through, okay, who's the diesel automotive person in the room? Maybe I shouldn't pick one. But usually, what's their, you know, the, the higher up they go here, if you start thinking about empathy and situational awareness and bedside manner and, and being resp all the different, the softer skills, you know, and, and how that kind of fits together, the idea of being well-rounded, the idea of being cross-trained, but to read this passage to know that you are being trained to be like Jesus. We don't go to school to learn to be like Jesus. You can, you can see that. You can, you can find, obviously, evangelical and Christian churches that have schools. You can have private seminary, college, Christian schools. You can be homeschooled. So there is an element that Jesus is in all that, but it's not in K-12. It's not in the public schools unless there's a person. The Lord always has a remnant that preserves this. But treating people with dignity, with respect, with kindness, and being selfless is, are not typically skill sets that come out on your, your high school diploma. I'm trying to get to a place where that actually is done in Arkansas, and I've got a couple of, of strategies to do that, working with some community college systems that are, are doing that. But how do you take the, the soft skill, some people call them, professional skills, the durable skills, just the, the EQ side? But... 13 years of school, get a high school diploma, being trained. Church, we're being trained. I don't know that we are supposed to necessarily be lifelong students, whereas we never get a vocation or a job. My goal in the state is to try to get as many people employed as early as possible because I don't think unless you're working that you can learn the relevance of what you're doing. It makes so much more sense to me to... to have the on-job training to actually see the application instead of just learning the theories. And I think church is that way. But to know that we can be in a position that this is like Jesus' school, that we get trained, but we don't stay trained or stay at a point where we're trained. We have to always update our skills with new and better and more advanced. And so it is a lifelong learner where we're constantly being challenged and learning things and being able to ultimately do what Jesus did. I just find that to be a phenomenal concept. So whenever I was uh, at the corporate position, I would tell people it takes five years to be a good mechanic. It takes seven years to be a good electrician. It takes eight to ten years to be a really good automation tech or industrial refrigeration. You don't just learn all that stuff. I remember the first two years of chasing down the thermodynamics in the face of each of the, the states of the ammonia in the pipe, and it took me two years to just even know what was connected. And there's probably one person in the room that'll know what I'm about to say. I was three years in before I realized that the booster discharge and the high-stage suction were the same thing. Three years. I had not gotten trained. I had no idea. And might be another one over here, and more. But you can be, just, you're going to be around it, and you can be exposed to it, and you never realize, unless you're being taught, unless you're being walked through, unless you're, you're learning a new type of thinking. And one of the best things that I've learned that the Lord has shown me is how to work through a process of troubleshooting. And I'm going to use my example, and I know this won't relate to everybody, but I start with what I know. Does it have power? Is it connected? I start working through what I know. Then I start working through the mechanism of how it gets what it's supposed to do at the end. And once you start to kind of map out these things in an over 
overarching understanding of, of what happens from beginning to end, you can start to go in and troubleshoot things. But do you know people that work in the mechanic in the troubleshooting space today, they don't do that? They either have to plug in a computer or they just change parts? They don't know. I, I, was, I taught Daryl something this week. Uh, we were talking about four cycle engines. I don't even know why it came up. And I said, Daryl, four cycle engines are easy. I said, it's suck, squeeze, bang, blow. There's four stages, and I don't, that might sound dirty. It's not like that. I don't know how you guys are thinking. But it's the intake, it's the compression, it's the power, and it's the exhaust. But when you have somebody that can train, and somebody that can show, somebody that can explain why things happen, how things happen, it makes a lot more sense to just change this part, just pull that, this piece out. You know, I watch uh, CNC operators all over the place whenever I go out to manufacturing today, and there are people that just, they push the buttons. They don't know how the process works. They, don't, they, they can monkey see, monkey do, which is a great place to be if you're in a zoo, but we are in a real world where we've got to be able to do something to figure things out. And we're not teaching people how to do this anymore. I don't think the church is learning how to be cross-trained like Jesus, to know the responsibility, the obligation. You are working towards this place in your, your walk with Jesus that you will do what he did. You will be like the teacher. You will be like Jesus. And I don't know how you feel right now. Sometimes I feel like I'm in, I'm in preschool compared to Jesus. And what am I doing to get through to understand the big picture of how stuff is? How does it work? What does it look like? Where does it come together? The training and the cross training. It just it comes together so much. So I, I found a passage that I wanted to work through, but I need you to have that previous background so you could see it in 1 Timothy. And as you make your way over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, I don't think it is the church's responsibility to train. I think it is the student's responsibility. I can see as a former teacher that I could have the curriculum, I could have the exercise, I could have the objectives, I could have all of the, the knowledge, and I couldn't transfer it to people that didn't want it. Now, it is important that the, the teacher create a, a platform or a person that their instruction resonates with. You know, you see, there's a reason why there's salted pretzels on the bar you can't make everybody come in and, and drink, but you, they can put salted pretzels out. So there is an obligation that people who are in a teaching role, which I think all of us are, whether it's a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, older sibling, friends, mentorship, your occupation, if you have whatever job you're working through, we have an obligation to teach, but you can't make people want to learn. But how do we put this information out there? So... Even in a high school classroom, and I've said this, this is actually, I started this as a sermon many, many years ago, and I was asking the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't understand people. I don't understand how everybody's in the room, everybody's hearing the same message, everybody's getting the same experience, but yet there's three different types of people. And, and he showed me this, and I've, I've said it before in other groups, so maybe you've heard me remark this before. We'll call that review. But I call them getters, quitters, and sitters. People that just sit in a pew or in a padded chair. You come in, you sit, you get up, you leave. People that just sit in church and do nothing with the information. It's, it's a parable of the, of the seed and the sower in Matthew 13. But the getter, the getter... Man, they want it, they're hungry, they're, they're sponges, and they just soak it in, and they, they, their, their brains are just rapid fire, and boom, 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 thinking how, how I'm hearing it from the preacher, I'm reading it in Scripture, I'm hearing it from a friend or in conversation or on a podcast, wherever you get your information, and you're doing something with the information, you're making it, you're filing it away in, in your system and, and trying to put things together, and, and you're watching it. That's, there's a getter group, there's a group of people that will be successful and live for the Lord regardless of what encounters you have at church. 
or family or at work. It's the same way in the classroom. There's a, about a third of my students that, that were getters. They're a third were sitters. They go either way. They're kind of late adopters. They pick their classes based on how the, their other friends pick their classes, and that's how they regulate themselves. And some of you are like, oh, man, he's talking to me. And, you, you know, you can, you can move roles. You, just because you're a sitter doesn't mean you stay a sitter. It's like a gross of bottle rockets. I can pull some out. They, they don't have a fuse. Others have a short fuse. Others, they just go, and they never pop. Others have a wet fuse, and it takes a while for it to dry out. And then the ones that are perfect are the ones that just, man, they take off like they're designed, and they, they hit the heights they're supposed to. People are this way. So the getter group, bam, they're out, the, out of the bottle. The sitters are burning for a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer, and then all of a sudden, they get it. But there's the third group, and it's the quitter. And the quitter, no matter what's said, no matter what's done, they're defeated, they're overcome, they, they can't get out of their own muck and mire, much less go to class to get trained. And I'm watching this, and I'm thinking through church, I'm thinking about home, thinking about work, previous work, and I realized, my Lord, I, I want to be a getter. I want to be, I want to be a student. I want to be a, I want to be trained, but I want to, I want to reach the heights that you've designed me for. Lord, cross train me. Show me, train me, show me how to do these things that Jesus did. You know, the scripture that says that greater things than this you shall do also. All the things that Jesus did. And I'm watching that as I think through how it looks for me to be cross-trained because I have weaknesses that need to be strengthened. I have some strengths that I probably need to, to back off of a little bit. But how do, I, how do I do that? With the horse, it's easy for me. If I ride in an arena, the majority of the time that I have this horse, then I just park the trailer at a place where there's no arena. And I start riding it through some trails and getting it, getting its mind clear, getting the horse's you know, more of its innate abilities to, to cross over obstacles and to pick up paces and lead changes and to, to turn and to navigate and, and to work that. And that balances the horse out. How do we create these places for church? How do we get where we're really, really trained? So those are the ideas that I wanted you to have as you look at this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 1, it begins with, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Okay, so this is my quitter group. Do you see that? I, don't, I mean, I mean y'all are saying this. This is the quitter group right here. Okay, over here. And they're defeated. Think about things taught by demons. How are things taught by demons? It's coming through a preacher somewhere that's not been cross-trained. They've been trained because the, the enemy does the same thing in opposite. But there are people who will fall away from the faith. People that won't, they'll, they'll be the bottle rocket that maybe never leaves the bottle. They can't quite get out. Or maybe the, the fuse never hits the powder and it never does anything. And it's, you know what you we call those it's a dud it doesn't it, it doesn't do anything it hasn't been trained it hasn't been fully trained it doesn't reach the, the, the ability the altitude that it was designed to that's a group such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. There's a design that God has and he's made it good and holy. We're in a place where whether it was Saul to Paul, and the laying down the blanket of what was clean, what was unclean food. You can look at the passage in Romans 14 that talk about the weak and the strong and how to check these out. And if we thank God for what we're taking in. So this first category of 
non-cross-trained people are very religious. They're very legalistic. They're, they follow a church's doctrine as opposed to the word of God. And the attitude and motives of the heart are not pure. They're self-serving. And it's, it's an area where it's good to know the word. It's good to have some doctrine. It's good to have to know the letter of the law and how it's written. But why is it written that way? It goes on to say in verse 6, if you point these things out to brothers and sisters, so they're brothers and sisters because they've accepted Christ, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of faith and the good teaching that you have followed. So there's the training, there's nutrition, you know, Cross training is important. You can't forsake the overall nutrition, the overall condition, removing pains and discomforts of the horse, and understanding how the body works, whether it be in the horse or maybe it's, uh, it's synchronized carburetors on a motorcycle. Maybe it's how engines uh, the, or machinery that links together with drives, how, to, how it all fits together. It's knowing that, making sure it's in good operation and good health. But what is the design and how does that come together? It says in verse 7, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Godless myths and old wives' tales. So I don't know if you, I'll just throw out a couple. Uh, a black cat crosses your path, open an umbrella inside a church, going behind, a, underneath a ladder, knocking on wood, cross your fingers, all kinds of things like that that, that we end up almost in ignorance saying it's not the way of training it's not something jesus said but yet oh i can't go outside that's the the lion will eat me like I, we talked about on wednesday what does this look like for me to to see exchanging a lie for the truth so if you've ever been mentored in a job by a person that is much your senior. You, you got to take the good with the bad. You got to know what information do I receive, what information do I let go, because you will get taught the wrong way. I know, for example, my dad went through law enforcement training. He went to a lead over here down Springs. And uh, did you go through there? The people who had grown up shooting guns had to be retrained because they were they were taught bad habits. And they would have to go through, and, and they would have to almost, it's like the military will just strip you of all of the things that maybe you've learned to get you down to a core self so they can build back on it. But whenever you're in the trades like I've been, I've learned the wrong way to do things. And knowing how to make that transition to the right way. I mean, this, this is, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll go back a little ways. Before... And this isn't for everybody, but there's a handful of people. Before NFPA 70E, I was opening up 500 MC panels, 600 volts, blow the door off. And I would go in there, no, no protection. And in these stories with, and I survived. I was, de I was taking out some old compressors. These compressors had like 500 horsepower electric engine motors on them. And the supervisor that I was working with said, well, yeah, I've, I've killed the power. Just go ahead and cut the wires. And I've got a pair of Klein side cutters that are now wire strippers. And I survived because I believed him and I cut through a hot leg of power. And it was such a bright light, all I could see was stars for, for a few minutes. And it, that took me, it, it got me to the point to where, I don't always have conversations like this, but sometimes I do, it was a uh, note to self. If Jimmy already killed it, don't believe him. Now, Jimmy since passed, I'm not sure why, but I went through this, this whole scenario of, I can't take somebody else's word for something that's, a, that's criticality, life and death. I have to know, I have to verify but yet churches are doing this all the time with their eternity. They're believing the person who's standing 28 inches above them. 
instead of getting in the Word of God themselves. You should never trust somebody who's telling you what the Word of God says without verifying it. Because the devil can just slip those little things through and the demons empower the people to do it. It's so important to match word for word what the Scripture says and then hold each other accountable to it. But just because it's offered doesn't mean that it's, it's healthy. So I'm reading this passage, just thinking through, you know, it, it says in verse 8, for physical training is of some value. So here's some more cross training. Physical training is of some value. I think it's important to the body of Christ that we be healthy. If we're healthy with exercise and diet and the right, the right proportions, we can be more effective witnesses. We're going to feel better. We're going to have more, more stamina. We'll be able to live longer different things like that, that there, there's some benefit to physical training, physical health. But godliness has value for all things. I wonder if we spend near as much time working on our spiritual health as we do our physical health. With the same determination, oh, oh I, I can eat that, I can't eat that, or I can't have this much or too much of this. And, and you make all these dietary decisions about how you consume things. Everybody else is just eating a dozen donuts. You know, you can, you can thank the Lord for a donut and get by with a, one or two. But at some point, there's, there's excess. You gotta, there's moderation in everything. But how, how do we deal with that spiritually? Are we receiving everything somebody tells us? If somebody that is older than you, somebody that may be in a position of respect or authority above you, says things that are critical to you, do you receive that? Knowing the source and knowing how that fits, I'm just, I'm just watching this, reading through Scripture, that we have a responsibility of godliness and valuing all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive because we've put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people and especially of those who believe. To know that they're likely, people aren't likely to meet people that, uh, we've got to go back. Okay, let me think through this. There are maybe three groups of people again. Those who will find Christ in church. That's, maybe it's not exactly thirds. Another group, possibly a third, that will find Christ through creation and community. The third group may not find him at all, may, may even find him and reject him. There's different ways of, of doing this, but I'm just wondering how well we do at being a believer full of the faith as consistently as we are on Sunday morning, as consistently as we are when we're, not, when we're alone or when we're with other people. To get to a place where people would be surprised by your actions and mannerisms that you're a Christian. Or that you even attend church regularly. To know that we have the duty and responsibility to be in the same. That we are, we are training. And, and I, I get this thing for me is, is yes I was a teacher but it's, it's almost built into me. I have to show people. I want to show people. I love to pass on knowledge because whenever I was coming up through the trades... I didn't have anybody, and it was, it's a school of hard knocks. But a lot of people that know things don't want to tell you because then you're now competing for their job. Or maybe it's a pride, ego, territory, turf war, all kinds of situations where people are, are not willing to tell you how to do things, or they'll tell you, and it's the wrong thing. But to be able to pass on knowledge and show somebody how much easier it is to do something, hey, if you do this and this, did you know? And you're kind of letting people create opportunities to learn have you seen this in your life? Everybody wants to learn something. Throughout your life, you want to learn something. We are made to learn. It's not always legal. I know whenever I taught greenhouse classes, I had students that, no, that they wouldn't listen to anybody else. But they wanted to learn. It was either to grow marijuana in their closet or it was something else. But it, 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 still the point is, the point is, they want to learn. Everybody. How do we harness that? How do we get that to a place where we 
are being cross-trained to be like Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Verse 11 says, command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And I think that's important. I'm not sure what the, the number for young is. I like to think it's maybe 50 and a half and under. <laughs> okay, I give up on that. But just because you're young, single digits, your first time in the teens, the 20s, don't let anybody look down on you. And this, this invariably happens. I'm, I'm telling you, whenever I was working in the, and before I could go to maintenance, I had to, I had to look at cars. Rail cars would put 280,000 pounds of, of chicken on a rail car before lunch. And then after lunch, we'd put another 288,000 pounds and we'd, we'd ship it. And I worked with some very difficult people. I'll be honest with you, I call them white trash. They drank their paychecks. They lived paycheck to paycheck. They broke in relationships. They, they couldn't function in a community. They could load real cars, but in the break rooms, they would have pornography. And they couldn't tell, they couldn't put five words together without one of them being negative. And that one word can be seemingly a noun, a pronoun, an adverb. It could be everything. And that it's just, it's a... It's a literacy crutch, and they would try to, to push pornography in front of my face to make me look at it. I was like 17, 18. Oh, when you get older, oh, whenever, they, these guys were all twice my age. But to realize that they looked down on me in public, but yet they respected me, they wanted to see what I would do, and even though they would do that in a group and, and almost like it, well, there's a phrase for that. Uh, they do it at college dorms a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, hazing, hazing. I was getting hazed in the worst way, but yeah, whenever I got done with that and I would go back to work, they'd come to me one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, would you pray for my son, pray for my daughter, pray for my wife? But yet in public, they were very demeaning and derogatory and condescending. And it was usually about my age. I never felt like I was old enough to, to have that maturity in people's eyes. I can even remember when I first started preaching, the first sermon I ever did, I think I was 21, and looked down upon because I was young. I still remember the message. I thought it was a good one. Do you? Tell me more. <laughs> so you, this is an unfortunate thing, that age is equated to respect. You know the largest group of people in Arkansas that aren't working, not even looking for a job? Nope. 18 to 34. Males, 18 to 34-year-old boys, not working. <laughs> I don't know how that works. I don't know how that works. But they're boys. They may be old enough to be considered men, but that their attitudes aren't like it. I've, like I've said before numerous times, I've shook a 14-year-old man's hand and a 40-year-old boy's hand. Age is not the number. Command these things. Teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. I wish that was taught in school today. Purity has a value. You'd make decisions whenever you're old enough that you'll regret the rest of your life if somebody could tell you don't do it, fight the urge, remain pure, and not just in sexual things, but in your thinking, in your vocabulary, and how you interact with people. Devote 
Okay, this is interesting. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture. Now, I could say, do you read your Bible? You give me an answer. Do you read your Bible at home? Give an answer. Do you read your Bible at work? Do you read your Bible at Walmart? Do you read your Bible at the, the restaurant you're fixing to go to? Do you read your Bible when you're... But we're, we're supposed to devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture to preaching and teaching because even though we're being trained, what I love about how education works is you don't have to know it all to be able to teach somebody. And this invariably happens. People will say, well, I don't know enough to teach. Well, I can tell you how the higher ed post-secondary part of our state works. If you want to teach a, a class to students who are getting their bachelor's degree, you have to have a master's. If you want to teach a class to master's degree students, you have to have a Ph.D. But there are people who can train and teach because they know how to do something that the person doesn't know how to do. How does that fit? We, we have an obligation to be able to transfer knowledge and show people how things work. And it, it comes so much better whenever they have a desire to want to learn it and even ask you for it. What an amazing thing that, that we can have that. Do not, this is, it keeps elevating, so just so you know. Do not neglect your gift. Uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 7, talks about the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. The nine gifts. And it's not like you get one or the other, in my opinion. It's like you get the whole toolbox, but I don't need to use a box and wrench. I might need to use a ratchet. I might need to use a, one for a brake line. I might need to have all these, you know, I might need a, a Ford starter wrench to get over the top of it. You, you have those tools, it doesn't mean you're using them all the time. But having those gifts, having those resources, having that availability of doing that. But do not neglect your gift. This is kind of a tiered statement because some people may not even have any gifts that they're exercising. Others may not even be aware that they have gifts. Or others don't know how to facilitate the gifts. And still others can neglect them. And you're going to see how you get these gifts in Scripture do not neglect your gift, which was given for you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. This goes back to a Acts chapter 19 passage and some other places where the elders of the church pray over, anoint with oil, and can impart the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I can show you Acts 19. You can read it, first six verses. And it's an option, it's, it's available. You know, how does that, how does that, I just don't know that we're, we're fully walking in the potential that Jesus died on the cross for us to have. It's like maybe we're just doing the best we can and just surviving and we're, we can't even get to arriving and thriving. Because we're too busy surviving. And it causes us to neglect the Holy Spirit. To neglect the purpose. To, to neglect the training. To neglect the teaching. To neglect God. By neglecting each other. Ultimately by neglecting myself. Do you see how it's all interconnected? We have an obligation. The, the word was command. I command and teach. You, you need to tell people. Command and teach these things. It's not an option for me. I can't make you, I can't physically force you, but I can, I can show you. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of the elders laid their hands on you. It wraps up the last two verses. Be Diligent in these matters. You know, the diligence part is really what I think separates the wheat from the tares, from the have-nots from the haves, the people who are really walking in Jesus, is to not neglect, but not, it takes, it's, it's an intentionality, and it's due diligence to do the right thing, to go the extra mile. 
You know, you watch people that have pride in their work, and this is what I, I like about trades folks, is that you can tell the people who just are going through the motions and the people who take pride in their work. I can op open up a distribution panel and see the people who take pride in their work. You can watch the, the bins and the radiuses of the conduit and how they're mapped and how they just, it, it's, it's beautiful to watch when somebody takes pride in their work they're intentional, they're diligent, and they are working in their gifts because you have mental gifts, you have physical gifts, you have emotional gifts, and there are spiritual gifts. And it's cross-training. It's operating as a whole, as a whole body. What does that look like then to be diligent in these matters? Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Wouldn't that be great? Remember, I think it was somewhere in the 2000s, people started having kindergarten graduations. In the 90s and the 80s, it was sixth grade graduations. And we put all this effort, you know, I don't even know that I, I have seen people without a high school diploma 40, 50, 60 years ago do greater things than somebody who's got three PhDs. I don't want to, I don't want to put precedence on one or the other. I want to inspire you to prayerfully consider how do you reach your full potential which God has designed you for. What does it look like to pull all the levers you have access to, to unlock all the horsepower under the hood, to be able to, to get a total animal that can do everything well but do some things in excellence? You know, I'm not going to take a bulldog and horse and do dressage necessarily. I'm not going to do steeplechase with a saddle bronc horse. How do you get these, you know, there's some design where we are really, really, really good at stuff, but then we should be pretty good at some other things too. And it's the spiritual side. I really feel like I might know how to do some physical things and I get by, but being able to, to explain things is really what I, I'm better at, and I'm, even though I'm struggling with it now, I want to be diligent in getting as good as I can to have diligent in these matters. Watch your life and doctrine closely. What you think, what you read, what you do, how you believe, how you interact, watch it closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Does everybody in the room have somebody that you've been praying for, for salvation? Somebody that you just, you lament and your heart breaks and all you just, you want somebody, or maybe they're a believer but they don't know it, or they're not acting like it and you just want to take them to the next level. These people are, who, who are your hearers? Those are your hearers. To watch you be consistent. You know, I go to some diligence to be consistent in my attendance because you'd know if I wasn't here. I try to be very intentional about realizing that in our culture, there's not a lot of things that people can count on anymore. I would want somebody to say, you know, if, if Mike says he's going to be here at 9 o'clock, I expect Mike, there, Mike to be there before 9 o'clock for the people that know me. That's how I'd want to be known. I don't want somebody to say, and maybe it's 10, and I'm not talking about time, I'm just talking about, are, are you somebody that other people can commit to? believe and and almost admire that you you do what you say you're going to do do you know that person that if they somebody said i'm going to be there i'm going to meet you at noon at this place you're shocked when they show up because that's not been their track record or they show up exactly on time or they're early you know how do we get to that place where we can be as consistent as jesus was consistent our culture doesn't have it anymore. You can't take people. You can't have a handshake agreement anymore. People don't honor their word. People are all the time trying to manipulate and do things for their selfish gain. And it's, doesn't it say in the latter days, in the latter times, you will deal with these things? I need you to know and to commit to the Lord through your engagement at church that this be a place that people find the truth. And maybe it's not from here exclusively, that we need to find people to disciple, people to train, people to encourage, people to write notes like 
I love you so much. We need to be, in, it's so interesting that, that kids, kids have this built into them. And we do something to them to take it out. And I don't know what age that is. What, what age do, you, do kids quit hugging their teachers or excited about school? And maybe it's based on their experience. But this is how we're made. We are made to be a witness, an expansion, an extension of who God is that I want you to consider yourself maybe even not being the student any longer, but being the teacher. If you've been a Christian for more than five years, making the transition from, okay, you've graduated. Now you go start teaching other people and encouraging and edifying and uplifting and praying and, and building those things out. We've got to get to the training point because it's not happening in our culture. The intentionality, the time, the diligence, and the consistency of being cross-trained, it's not easy. It's so much more conv convenient to just open the latch on the gate, swing it out, go into do your 10-second event in the arena, and then put it back on the trailer and, and go out again. It takes time. It takes intentionality. It takes balance. It, all these different benefits that we have been made to be like Jesus. And I worship him. Father, it's our desire to seek your presence, to find your truth, to have that getter mentality, God, that we want all that you have to offer. Father, for what you gave us in your only begotten Son, it cost you everything. Lord, to know that Jesus and God, um, to even think that we could be like that, to be like you. Father, your Holy Spirit, that is our counselor, our guide, even our teacher, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on those who are open to receiving your word and your gifts. God, for those that you have designed us to be. Lord, I want to speak for those that, that don't know their gifts or that have not had the elders pray over them to, rele to receive their gifts. And Lord, I want to even take some time this morning to do that for those who would desire to know either Christ is their Savior, hey, I want to enroll in school, or I want to go next level with you, God, in walking in the gifts of your Holy Spirit. We bless you, Lord, as I thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. That would want to come to class.